Well, welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And it's been like a month since we last recorded, and we're going to kind of start our episodes by saying it's been a month since we last recorded. It, Sorry. It's like our version of confession. Yeah. It's 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 been a month since my last confession. Um, forgive us, for we have failed to record. <laughs> but we're Lutherans, so we, we make excuses about our vocations and stuff. Yeah, yeah, busy and, and life and whatnot. And mm-hmm. I don't believe we ever advertised this as a weekly podcast, did we? Right. So we've never broken that. So it's not really our so fault. So I think we're still doing okay if we call it a monthly podcast. It'd be great if we could do an every other week podcast. But either way, we'll we'll do whatever we can to keep getting this out. This is our series on hermeneutics and if you appreciate what we do here at crucial productions with crucial conversations and the other things we're involved in head on over to crucialproductions.org slash give any amount any gift is very much appreciated after you've given to your church first and supported the work there so kevin what is on our plate today well we've talked a little bit about uh, the Bible and how it was put together by editors and, and we, how we added verse numbers and chapter numbers and headings and subheadings and names of books and translated those books into English and all kinds of fun things. But now the question is, okay, so we know all that and we know that the Bible as we have it today between two covers published on paper and columns and neatly organized with punctuation and capital letters and study notes and maps and punctuation is page so nice. numbers and all kinds of that stuff. None of that's really original nor necessarily inspired. That's all the stuff to help us read the inspired text. Yeah. Well, the next issue is if you are reading a Bible that's pr- produced, you know, after 15 or 1611, your books are probably in the same order or roughly in the same order as every else books in your Bible are in the same order. That's not true a hundred percent of the time, but you know, vast majority of the Bibles have the books in the same order, same Mm -hmm. books in the same order, right? You look at the NIV, the new international version. You look at the, the RSC revised standard version. You look at the King James version of 1611 and following new King James version, new revised standard version, the English standard message. The Message Bible. I don't have, actually. I don't know. Does it? Is that's not even a Bible, but well, the Message it's, Interpretation Book. It's, it's not a translation. Yeah, it's not a translation. Way. Definitely the, not a translation. The Message um, is is one guide's interpretation as he reads through the Bible, basically. Um, but but basically, all the Bibles you're going to find that claim to be either translation or a paraphrase are going to follow the same order of books and the same division of testaments, right? Yeah. So the question is, does that matter? <laughs> is it is it something that we should pay attention to as you read it? If we're talking about or a series it, of hermeneutics, does that yeah. help us understand scripture because it's in a particular order? If they change the order, do we then understand scripture differently because of that? Or might they be trying to do something different with scripture to cause you to understand it differently if they change that order around? And then, so so the real question is, is there theological importance to the order of the books you know is there a theological importance for the way that the order of the books encourage us to read scripture um, in a certain order or with a certain concentration on certain books so that's what we're going to look at today well that's a good question because we encourage people to read the bible in a different order than it's published we have many way back at the beginning of this podcast when we have our uh, bible reading plan and, we and said, we don't might, start at verse one. <laughs> don't don't start in the beginning, and, and we'll and we'll recapitulate that. We definitely would. We would had restate a, that again. We had a hermeneutical reason for telling them yes. to read it differently, even though we hadn't yet started talking in terms of our hermeneutic series. Okay. Anyways, so it's as you as you well know, you can open your Bible to the table of contents and get an overview of the Bible. Right, and as we've talked about before, and, and most people know, and it's not bad to review, the, but the Bible is a unique book um, because this one book called the Bible or the Holy Bible is actually made up of 66 books. It's a book of books. Some people call it a library. So <laughs> it, and don't worry about why, but in the history of the church, we've referred to the individual um, 66 smaller units within the Bible as books of the Bible. So you have the book of Habakkuk, 
right? You have the book of Isaiah. You have the book of Psalms. Mm-hmm. You have the book of John. You have the book of Ephesians. That's the just book, the way we the talk about it. The book of Bell and the Dragon. You have that not oh. in the Bible, but you oh. have it in the Apocrypha, which Oops. is kind of an addendum to your Old Testament if you want to. Some, some um, of our listeners may open up their Bible and find that in there, though. So we won't right, talk that's about fine. that in this episode. We'll, we'll, do it, we'll do a little bit on the it's Apocrypha, too. At least a passing up mention. Yeah. yeah, we will. So so the question is, you know, do the order of these books, the groupings even of these books, make any difference? And mm-hmm. obviously, we're going to say yes, just because <laughs> we might as well. Well, they'll, they'll make a difference, but... But what is that difference? Yeah, and, and what yeah. does that mean? If you change it, are you therefore not a Christian? Well, right? you it's, know, there's always that fun question. Right. So, again, as you look at the table of contents... We're going to advocate you just skip the Old Testament for a second and go to the New Testament. We're not saying to ignore the Old Testament. We're not saying the Old Testament isn't important. We're not saying the Old Testament isn't the Word of God. We're just saying for a second, just skip over it and go to the New Testament. So we're going to start with the basically the last third of the Bible, which starts with the book of Matthew and ends with the book of Revelation. That's the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And remember, just for a little review, it's called New Testament because it's newer than the <laughs> Old Old Testament. Testament. Right. <laughs> so the New Testament are the books that are written after the resurrection of Jesus. And the Old Testament are the books that are written before the incarnation of Jesus. So before Jesus was born, you have the Old Testament. After he rose from the dead, you have the writing of the New Testament. And in terms of timeline, there's what a 400 year ish gap in between the two. So right about 400 years. If you about if you date Malachi, kind of the last book probably written of the Old Testament around 350, which is fair. 350 BC, so 350 years before the birth of Christ, and then you then you measure Matthew as probably the earliest of the New Testament books written around 50 AD. That's nice round numbers, right? Mm-hmm. That gets you right at 400 years. So, yep. and, and again, when we see years, we're not talking like to the date, January 1st of that year. It's a ballpark. Yeah, they're estimates. Remember, these these books don't have timestamps on them like, a, like your iPhone photos would or something. <laughs> you can't look back at the emails and say, well, I sent the final draft off to the editor at you know, 759 on August 3rd. Or all, all your VCR video recordings from the 80s that have that time right, stamp on tan- the bottom. Time stamp. Like, how do I get that off? Dad, yeah. why did you turn that on when you recorded? That's so annoying. Exactly. And, and we just don't have that. So when we yeah. talk about dates of the Old Testament or New Testament, um, these are estimates from all kinds of different things that give us the ability to estimate dates. But so when we say about 50, about 350, you know, those are literally... Um, estimates and that's and that's fine it's close enough for us Mm -hmm. so yeah about 400 years between the writing of the testaments but if we if we go to the new testament then what you have the new testament really is three main sections okay if you can just look at the table of contents the first section is the gospels okay four books named after four guys matthew mark luke and john the four gospels Mm -hmm. you guys know this Okay, yep. so the four gospels and, and the easy thing about the gospels is, is we just put the author's name right on top of them. So it's really easy. They're named after the guys who wrote them. Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, and John wrote John. That's the first section of the New Testament. The second section of the New Testament are Paul's letters. And that goes from Romans to Philemon. And those are named after the recipients so not the author, because they'd all be named Paul. <laughs> so they're First named after, Paul, yeah, exactly, second, thirteen Paul. Paul. Third, so, oh man, <laughs> we don't want to do that. That's so he annoying. named them after the recipients, and the cities, the the ones that are named for cities, are written to the churches that that are either either in or near that city or that region. So mm-hmm. Romans is to the church in Rome, Corinthians is to the church in Corinth, or again, or around the city of Corinth. Yeah. Um, Galatia is actually more of an area. So the letter to, a, to Galatians are to the churches in Galatia, which is kind of a region. Um, but then at the end of Paul's letters, you get letters to individuals. So you have Paul's letters to Timothy. You have one letter to Titus and one letter to Philemon. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's the second main section of the New Testament. Now, Kevin, now you skipped something. Peter's looking and he's wondering Here. why I skipped a book. 
Well, you're, well, so we have this little you're book. You're supposed to be the PhD scholar yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. A I New did Testament, on purpose. and you like skipped. I did. <laughs> And and that's because between I know our these listeners two sections, are freaking out about now. Yeah. Doesn't he know the Bible? What's going on? <laughs> between these two sections, we have a book that isn't a gospel, and it isn't a letter of Paul. Right. But it's actually written by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the third gospel. Okay. And and it seems to be from from even the book itself, the book of Acts. We're talking about the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it seems to be the second volume of Luke's writing. So he wrote a gospel and then he wrote the book of Acts and the book of Acts is called Acts because it is about the Acts of the Apostles. So it's not named after the author nor the recipient. It's actually named after the content, mm -hmm. which makes it weird right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it, like I said, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the categories. It's not a gospel and it's not one of Paul's letters, but it is one of the more important books of the New Testament. So it goes right after the Gospels and right before Paul's letters because it goes after the Gospels because it was written by a Gospel writer, Luke. And it goes before Paul's epistles because it kind of historically fits between the Gospels and Paul's letters. Yeah. That's kind of where it goes. So the book of Acts tells us the history of the church from the ascension of Jesus until the death of Paul. Well, He's imprisoned, about to die, basically, right. in the mid '60s. Okay, so that's about 30 years, 35 years or so of, of the first history of the church, and it's how the apostles. Now, the Book of Acts, very quickly, I do this for every book, but the Book of Acts is basically focused on Peter and Jerusalem, and Paul and the Gentiles. Okay, that's kind of the structure of the Book of Acts: is you have Peter in Jerusalem. And then you have Paul and the Gentiles and those two things overlap. And that's part of the issue in the middle of the book of Acts, but that's basically the book of Acts. So what that does then is it gets us from the gospels to Paul's epistles. So those are the two main sections of the gospels and Paul's officials. And in between there, we have the book of Acts. It's a kind of a okay? nice transition, book. kind of a nice little transition book. It doesn't make sense structurally. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah it I, actually I does. see why this works. Great. Yeah. And, our, and as far as authors go, it makes sense too, because you have the gospel, yeah. Luke, you know, the gospel writer, Luke. Okay. Now the third section of the new Testament is what's called the Catholic epistles, Catholic epistles, meaning not meaning Roman Catholic, but meaning that their audience was more of a general audience. Okay. So they're not written to specific audiences. They're written more generally. And those books that go from Hebrews to Jude, and those books are named after their author, just like the Gospels, with the exception of the book of Hebrews, because <laughs> no uh, one knows who wrote we Hebrews. We don't know. Yep. So we just named it for the Hebrews, which seems to be the recipients. But we, we may have had some fun conversations on our yes, podcast about we might have theories on, this. on who yes. wrote it. So, I can't remember if that was in the podcast or in other, other settings. Other but anyways, do. yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a fun argument because you can't win it or lose it because nobody knows. So right. we're kind of free to argue. But um, it is certainly, it certainly belongs here in the Bible. It's certainly yeah, God's it's, word. It's a wonderful book. Yep. Um, so Hebrews through Jude, um, again, named after the author with the exception of the Hebrews. And that's the third section of the New Testament, the Catholic epistles. And then we have another book that's kind of just hanging out there on the end, the book of yeah. Revelation which is its own little category of apocalyptic literature. Um, it's, it's the revelation, the apocalypse of John. And again, it kind of receives its prominence from its author. It was mm -hmm. written by the same guy who wrote the fourth gospel. Okay. So the third gospel writer has the book of acts. And then the fourth gospel writer has the book of revelation on the end. Plus kind of the three other Catholic epistles. Well, and then that John also has <laughs> three epistles, first, second, and third John, all the same John. Right, yep. so you have the Gospel of John, three epistles, and Revelation, all the same John, the coolest of the apostles. <laughs> and <laughs> I was waiting for you to say that. Yes, he he's the yeah. best. Yeah. So so that's the way the New Testament is laid out, and and the reason we're going through all this, I know you can look that up and kind of learn it, but just that's just an overview, a quick overview. And the question today is, does it matter? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, this is something that people don't often talk about. But if you read the church fathers, if you look at the history of the church, you will find this to be true, is that 
the church actually reads the books with a certain priority to them. Mm -hmm. Meaning, and, and sometimes the best way to say it is to say it backwards. We don't interpret the New Testament through the book of Revelation. Well, well we, we shouldn't. Right. Well, we um, meaning the church, the yeah. historic Orthodox Church. <laughs> it happens, um, and boy, it, does it people get do weird. it. Right, but that gets you off the rails and gets you away from Orthodox Christology and, and yeah. Christianity. Yep. So we don't interpret the New Testament through the book of Jude. Um, we don't interpret the New Testament through the book of um, Second Peter. Or James. Or James. That's a big one. Yeah. So what we actually do as the church is we read the New Testament with some books having priority. And it's very simple. One of the reasons that I that I laid out the way I did is because the the books of most importance in the New Testament are the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Those are the books that tell us the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's why they're there. And they are the books of greatest importance. If you go to a liturgical church like we do, you will probably notice that you physically confess this when you read them. Yep. At least in my church, we do. Yeah, my church, we do. So when we read the Old Testament, we often enjoy our comfy pew seated. <laughs> when you read the epistle of Paul or some other epistle, maybe of the, first Peter or first, first John. The first reading, if it's yeah, Pentecost or, season, right. it's Acts. Yeah. It's Acts it's in the Easter season. That's right. Yeah. Um, we'll remain seated. But then when it comes time for the gospel lesson, we all stand. And that's exactly the confession that these are the important books because they're the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and often contain the very words of Jesus. Not, so not we only, stand. Not only do we stand in some of our churches, the pastor will actually walk out into the middle of the congregation following a pr crucifix and read it from the middle and we all turn and face it. Sometimes we have processionals with the gospel. We have yeah. candles. We have a crucifix. We have crucifers. We have acolytes. We have <laughs> assistant pastors holding the book open. We have a guy who reads. I mean, we kind of we do all kinds of things in a liturgical way to show the importance of the words of our Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That these are the word, as Peter says in John chapter six, these are the words of eternal life. Yeah. That's why they deserve such importance, not just in our worship. Which, depending on in the our lives. setting that you're using for the service, you will actually say that right. before the reading of the gospel. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And, and then now we read the gospel. And then you say, Alleluia, which means praise God, right? So yeah. we're, we're rejoicing in this, yep. these words of life given to us freely um, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so in a very real way, that it's actually a hermeneutic, is that we read the Gospels as having prominence or priority. Those are the important books. So and I know this might sound a little strange to some people. It's not diminishing the authority or inspiration of the other books. Sim it's simply that these have always been the chief books of the Bible for the Christian church. Okay? The, these are, can you say it this way? These are the ones that help us understand all the other ones? Yes. So okay. these are, as one of my favorite um, theologians always says, kind of the interpretive matrix. <laughs> you, you start with the, the, the Gospels. Yeah. Okay? And then the second most important section then is Paul's letters, Paul's epistles. Okay, so then we read Paul's epistles. And um, now, Peter, we've been saying a lot of stuff here. Yeah. We do are say you gonna, a lot of stuff. Are you going to read something in Paul's epistles that contradict what you read in the Gospels? Uh, not if you're reading it correctly. Right. So, so when we say order of importance or we say prominence, we're not saying they're fighting against each other. Right. Right? Because they're not. They're all inspired, they're all inerrant, they're all God's word. But as we interpret things, you, you can go you can actually get some really weird interpretations if you start with the wrong books and yeah. then read the other books in light of those. So what we're saying is we want to read Paul in light of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ as as we find in the gospels. To to put a a more charitable spin on this if you if if i can what we're saying is if you're having difficulty understanding something in paul if it's confusing you go back to jesus 
Mm-hmm. See what he said about it, and he'll tell you what Paul meant. Or how he lived it. Yeah. Read sure. read about the actual life of Jesus, and you'll see what Paul's talking about. Or you'll understand why Paul's saying what he's saying. Or you might not. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> You might need additional help. Right, and you need help, and that's fine. That's why you have pastors and things that will help you. But 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 that's exactly right. If you plant your feet in the middle of Paul, having no context with with the Gospels, well, that's where you're going to get weird. Well, and just and just think about it. It well, we won't get into all of that, but that's that's kind of what hermeneutics is going to get you to is how how does this physically work out? How does this actually play out? So then, after that, actually come the the Catholic epistles, and. This is where um, I, I go in with fear and trembling to this section. <laughs> but this is where we do have to understand the ideas of homologumina and antilegomena. Antilegomena, yes. Okay, Such so homologumina and antilegomena. So homologumina, those are the <laughs> books that everyone agreed are scripture all the time. No one's ever questioned them. Antilegomena are books that some people didn't necessarily read with as much frequency as the other books and therefore weren't entirely or d- or didn't convinced. Have them. Or, or didn't churches, have access. Right. For, yeah, areas for whatever of the church reason. where that letter hadn't gotten there and they're like, wait, you got le- we didn't get that letter. So so when I say didn't read, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't like it. It might mean they didn't have it or didn't know of it with the same prominence as the other letters. Right. So the homologumina are the Gospels, now just listen to this the gospels all of paul's letters the book of acts okay yeah first peter and first john yep okay that's a list i had in my head okay so now just listen to what we just said about the 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 important parts of the new testament the gospels paul's letters and the book of Acts kind of fits in there between those two, right? It's it kind yeah. of goes back and forth. It's it's kind of doesn't have its own category, so it's kind of important with Paul's letters as far as an interpretive matrix goes, and it kind of gives you historical things with Paul's letters too. So it's kind of I'd say the book of Acts is kind of in there somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so so the homologumina again, the got the four gospels, all thirteen of Paul's letters, the book of Acts, First Peter. And first John. Now, what you see is that of the Catholic epistles, Hebrews, James, first, second Peter, first, second, third John, and Jude, only two of those are homologumina. So when it comes to the Catholic epistles, that is not the body of literature that's going to serve as the most important interpretive matrix for the rest of the New Testament. It is actually going to be what you read kind of in light of the Gospels and it's Paul. It's the supporting material, if you will. Yeah, okay. You're going to read it in light of the Gospels and Paul and the Book of Acts. Okay, now 1 Peter and 1 John are homologumina, so they will have a little bit more of an authoritative role than something like Jude or 2 Peter or even Hebrews. Mm-hmm. Okay, now the book we haven't mentioned at all is the Book of Revelation. And that, and we'll, is, we'll, we'll deal with this some other time. But the Book of Revelation has a very interesting history in its interpretation and inclusion in the canon. So, but at the same time, it's one of the most helpful for making the point of priority. Yes, so, exactly. So we'll we'll get to it. We will mention it here be, just because it's so helpful and like, oh, that's what priority means. Right. Okay. So, But we're not there yet. We're not quite so, there yet. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we should, though, so just pause and say this is exactly what we mean, is that okay. if you read the book of Revelation first and then interpret Paul and the Gospels through the book of Revelation, you will not end up with orthodox interpretation of Scripture. You will actually misinterpret the Bible because the book of Revelation is written in order to be read within the context of having understood the Gospels and Paul and the Old Testament. to, To put this another way, the the American evangelical fascination with end times, mm-hmm. uh, with the Tim LaHaye left behind books, with Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth in the 70s, all the way back to, to Schofield in the end of the 1800s, putting all this together and creating this, this interpretation of Revelation, which is called premillennial dispensationalism, if we're going to use the big words. But this, Whew. I know, I know. Um, but this whole idea that we're we're waiting 
for a rapture that Christians are going to be taken up first, and then there's going to be seven years of tribulation in which everybody apparently has a second chance. I mean, the, this popular understanding of what the end times looks like, they're, they're, everybody has a second chance, but man, is it going to be bad. And then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back and reigns here on earth for a thousand. Uh, th- that whole timeline, which then leads you to reading the book of Revelation, where looking for Russia or Iran um, and Black Hawk helicopters, we've mentioned some of this stuff on our podcast before as like, oh, okay, Black Hawk helicopters in Revelation. That reading is made possible by not understanding priority, where you take Revelation as this, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, by the way, which he didn't really come into my right. <laughs> what I just said. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, that's the problem. Um, you you take the book of Revelation and read it and say, okay, now this is going to inform everything else. And you actually start going backwards in Scripture. So when Paul in Second Thessalonians talks, or First Thessalonians, which one is it? First, yeah, talks about being taken up. Well, that's obviously the rapture because in the book of Revelation it says this, and therefore when Paul says it, he must mean this. First Thessalonians four thirteen is that what it is? Close. Try to remember somewhere around there. It's in um, four. Yep. It's in four. Yeah. Very good. Um, it's it's on a plaque on the back of mm-hmm. a bathroom door that I'm I'm remembering it from because I'm anyways. All right. Too much information. Yeah. Too, TMI. Um, but then you take that and say when Jesus in Matthew 25 and 24 in the Olivet Discourse is talking about the sheep and the goats and the end times and one will be taken and one will be left. Oh, well, that's that's the rapture because Paul mentions it and we understand what Paul says because Revelation talks about it in this way. Notice how we're going backwards. Like Yeah, we're, and, and again, like, like Peter's illustrating, this entire theological idea is actually suffering from that this misappropriation of the order and importance of revelation. Yeah. So, and, and, and not only that, but then, but then it spreads to the book of Daniel. Yeah. The book of Zechariah. And you start interpreting Ezekiel, the entire by and parts of Ezekiel, parts of not all of Ezekiel, parts of Ezekiel. Right. And this is the problem is you're actually starting to interpret the other books of the Bible by books that honestly have never been seen as the important books of the old Testament or new Testament. And, and this is part of what we're talking about. When we, when we talk about things like Orthodox Christianity or the history of the church or the church, we're not talking about what's happened since 1890. We're talking (laughs) about what has happened since the apostles walked away from the empty tomb and said, this is what Jesus taught us. See, we don't want to start, we don't want to interpret the Bible based on new ideas in the 19th century or 20th century or 21st century. We want to read the scriptures as Jesus taught the apostles after his, after his resurrection, before his ascension. That's what we're going for. So when we say this is what the church has done, we are saying you can trace the history of these ideas all the way back to the early church fathers who are quoting the apostles and even the new Testament itself. Okay. And that's part of what we're going to do now as we talk about the old Testament is we're going to talk about how the old Testament is viewed by the new Testament writers and by the early church. Okay. Now this is going to get a little weirder because our (laughs) English Bibles are no longer laid out the same as the Hebrew Bible was. And it, it, there's, it, we don't have the time to go into all of this. Yeah. But basically, some of it is still preserved. Okay? Some of it is still preserved. The first five books of your Bible, your English Bible, are what's called the books of Moses or the, the Pentateuch, Pentateuch yep. or the Torah. Okay? Those okay. are all synonyms for the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? And those books are the primary books of the Old Testament. Very much like the Gospels in the New, those books are the most important books of the Old Testament. If you want to read what is the Old Testament about, make sure you've read those books. Now, 
on this show, we are not afraid to say obvious things like Leviticus might not be the best book to start with. <laughs> Numbers might not be the best book to start with. So if you're going to read those books, go ahead and read like Genesis and the first, you know, 35 chapters of Exodus and then maybe Deuteronomy, right? Right. Yeah. Leviticus and Numbers, you'll probably get lost and give up. <laughs> it's not, we do believe they're the word of God. How many cubits again? Yeah. But what but, kind of um, cloth? And, and this is the issue is, is remember, we're now saying, read the Torah now, now I'm going to say this and I might get in trouble for it, but, but I'm going to say it anyway. Read the Torah, understanding the Gospels and Paul's letters yeah, and the Catholic epistles and, of so course, when, the Book of Acts. When, when we presented our reading plan at the very beginning of this podcast, we actually explicitly said, yes, don't read these first. Right, don't it's read them not going to if, if you have little to no familiar, familiarity with the Bible, especially, but if you're trying to gain a deeper understanding of of scripture and what it means don't read these first it don't won't help first. you nope so <laughs> so then in the old testament you have the books of moses as being very important and that's true for the writers of the new testament they quote moses as having chief authority okay then you have the prophets and the prophets this is going to sound really strange it just <laughs> just trust me on this it's most of the books of the Old Testament that have somebody's name on them. Yeah. Okay. So most of the books of the Old Testament have someone's name on them, with the exception of Job. Job is not a prophet, even though it has a guy's name on it. But basically, look for guys' names. So, it, so is the Joshua is, one of the prophets? Yes. So oh, Joshua okay. judges, not Ruth. That's not a guy's name. It's a girl's name. So right. none of the girls' names. So Joshua judges. So Ruth and, and Esther are not part of the prophets. Ruth and Esther are not really part of the prophets. Okay. Um, you're going to have first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, not really first and second Chronicles. Don't worry about those. Those get skipped. Um, and then you get a bunch of the English order is very hard to deal with. But anyway, <laughs> most of the guys' names. And then you get the big prophets. You get Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, and then you get the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Micah. Those are the books that end out, out in your Old Testament. They're actually part of the prophets, okay? Now, the third part of the Old Testament are all the books that are left, and those are called wisdom literature, okay? Hmm. Wisdom literature in the, in the original formation of the Old Testament started with the book of Psalms, okay? And it was called the Writings, so you had the law of Moses, the prophets, and then what was called the writings. And those three sections were actually in order of importance. The books of Moses were first, the prophets were second, and the writings were third. Now, having said that, don't hang up. <laughs> so the law of the, the books of Moses were the most important, and then the, and the prophets, and then the Psalms. But listen to this. The most quoted book in the New Testament of the Old Testament is the book of Psalms. Yeah. Okay. Because even though the rest of the writings were not seen as overly important, the Psalms were seen as extremely important because they were the words of David. Not all written by David, but primarily the words of David or, you know, about the Messianic king, the, the, when I say messianic, I mean like prophesying the Messiah, which is Jesus. Yeah. So a lot of prophecies, a lot of quotations about the Messiah are from the Psalms, the New Testament. Um, and then the next highest quoted book is Isaiah, a prophet. And then the next one is Deuteronomy. Okay. And that's one of Moses' books. So there you have all three sections of the Old Testament quoted in prominence, Psalms, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy. Now, that is a little misleading because there's actually more quotes from the Torah than any other section if you kind of add up all the books. But <laughs> but the point is, even the Old Testament, you don't read the book of Job to establish the theology of the Old Testament. Okay? Oh, that's that's yeah. not its job. That And people do. And it right. leads to some weird places. If weird you take places. Job as like, this is, this is it. I'm starting here. Yeah. You don't read Ecclesiastes. As your oh. theology of the Old Testament. 
You don't you don't want to read Esther or Ruth or I mean start naming these books and they and I think you can start seeing what we're saying. Imagine is, reading Judges as like this is the summary right, of the Old the, Testament and what it teaches. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> and so everyone think, did what was right in their own eyes. Uh oh. I think if you if you really, you know, don't react out of fear that we're somehow, you know, diminishing divine authority or, or divine inspiration, because we're not doing that. You simply acknowledge that that God gave us these books and that some of them kind of have more importance or more prominence to help us read the other ones. Yeah. So they're all inspired. We believe in plenary inspiration of scripture, that the original autographs, the original handwritten manuscripts were all inspired by God perfectly. There's no errors in them. Um, we believe that the entire Bible is the word of God. It doesn't just contain the word of God. It actually is the word of God. Yep. We believe, as we've said before, in a Christological and Christocentric interpretation, meaning we believe that from Genesis to Revelation and back again, it's all about Jesus. It's all telling us about Jesus. It's prophesying about Jesus. It's relating to us, Jesus. And actually, we believe, as Lutherans, we believe in something called the efficacious nature of Scripture, that Scripture actually does something. Yeah, God's Word does stuff is how it I usually does say that stuff, one. Right, yeah. that's the fun way to say it. <laughs> so so none of this is to diminish any of those things. This is all actually in concert with that. This is actually promoting that. And so yeah. what we say is as you as you head into this, this milieu of 66 books all in the cover that says the Holy Bible, does it matter where you open? The answer is, yeah, it does actually. For it does for understanding it. It doesn't if all you want to do is read God's word. You, yeah, it's all o- God's word. You can open up your Bible. It's all God's word. But in order to understand what it means, what it's about, why it was written, some of those bigger picture questions, yeah, it certainly matters where you start. So what we're saying in all of this, just to kind of get it down to a, a kind of a practical level, level is... If you're wanting to read the Bible, please do. That's what we're doing this for, is, is to encourage all of us to spend more time in the Word, including Peter and I, to encourage us to spend sure. more time in the Word. Yep. Family devotions, obviously in church every Sunday. But beyond that, family devotions, personal devotions, you know, reading just for fun. What book are you reading? You should always, oh, I'm reading I'm reading through Ephesians right now. I'm reading through Mark. I'm, I'm kind of doing both right now. Um, and also reading through Romans. <laughs> but, you know, it, but these are the things is, is be in the word of God. And, and the, what we're saying is if you're, if you're kind of looking for what book should I read, what book should I start with? Start with the gospel. Start with John. I would like that one because it says in the beginning, in the beginning. So, you know, don't start <laughs> the beginning in Genesis, start the beginning in John um, or Mark or pick one of the gospels. It doesn't matter. There's four. You can pick one, read a gospel, and then maybe go to one of Paul's letters and read Galatians or Ephesians or Romans, read one of those, read the ones you've heard of, right? Those fun mm-hmm. ones you've heard of. And what I suggest is really kind of get familiar with the story of the gospels. Get familiar with the way Paul writes before you venture out in anything else. Before you venture out into, you know, Hebrews or, or into Deuteronomy, maybe, maybe spend some time with the gospels and Paul until you kind of feel like, you know, I know the story. I know the story of Jesus. I understand how the gospel is presented. Him. I understand how Paul talks about the death and resurrection of Jesus and how that is God's free gift of salvation for every single sinner. And that salvation is by grace through faith because of what Christ has done. See, that's Paul. That's what mm-hmm. Paul is going to keep saying. He's going to say, now you've read the history of what Jesus did. Let me explain. Yeah. Let me explain kind of theologically what's going on yeah. here. Right? So when he died, what happened? Well, he's, he's paying the price for sins. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means they all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, that's, that's Paul. That's Romans chapter three. So that's what we're saying is, is you kind of get that in your head, get that in your spirit, it, understand it, that. If, if you're a Lutheran, one of the ways that, another way to see this, to understand what we're saying is you don't go to Acts to find out what baptism does. Right. Uh, the book of Acts has lots of examples of baptisms happening, you know, in a historical sense. Here's here's entire families being baptized. Here's three thousand people being baptized all at once. Um, it just says here here it's happening. Paul mm-hmm. is where you go, or 
first Peter, he also does mm-hmm. this too, where he actually explains, okay, here's what's going on mm-hmm. when that baptism happens. Here's the theological significance. Here's why you get baptized. I mean, this, once again, here's the gospel. So we read about, well, I'm going to say Acts. In this case, I'm calling Acts a gospel just yeah, that's right. <laughs> for, for the purposes of this. Here's, here's the thing happening. And here's Paul saying, look, here's what it means. Right. And another thing, just as you as you mentioned that, another thing for us to remember is that the institution of the sacraments, the giving of the means of grace are in the Gospels. Yeah. Right. I mean, Paul recapitulates it. He repeats it. But even he says, I'm giving you what I received. Yeah. Okay. So in First Corinthians 11, he does give us the words of institution. But even there, he says, I'm giving you what I received. And you can actually go back and read those words in Matthew, Mark and Luke. So the Lord's Supper is instituted in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Baptism is instituted by Jesus in Matthew. It's recapitulated the ending of Mark. Okay, You have yeah. Jesus telling us to live in his word, that his word is life. In the Gospel of John, you have that. You have that in the Gospel of Mark. Okay, So you have actually these ideas of the means of grace actually in the Gospels. And so then when you think about the priorities of all this, then Paul kind of helps us understand that a little bit, right? And then you just keep reading the New Testament and say, okay, okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. It's, it's getting like a fuller picture of this. But we're not starting over with Jude and saying, oh, Jude said this over here. That's going to become an important doctrine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't do that. You kind of say, okay, Jude's, Jude's writing this to the church who has received word and sacrament from the gospels from paul and now we're going to read jude kind of in that order right yeah so so jude yeah it's, it's actually a good text to read to help you understand some of this and it brings in a little bit different viewpoint it has some great text in it right that <laughs> the faith that's been entrusted to the saints you know that's good stuff we like yep. that yeah we like that a lot um, so, so we're not saying to be scared of anything in the Bible. There's certain nothing to be scared. Well, there are some things to be scared of, but not, not I, too Angels scared. are pretty scary, Kevin. Well, if you and, actually understand what scripture teaches about them, and they're there's pretty a, scary. There's some weird stories in Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah. So uh-huh. Those are, and Revelation. Those are fun to read. But, but again, what, what we're really commending is a Christological view of the new, of the Bible that you really do read the record of God's dis- distinction, distinctive and definitive action in Jesus Christ to save us. Um, we, we have one final thing that you have to mention because we forgot to bring it up in terms of why are things ordered the way they are, and that's Paul's letters were first written on a scroll. Yeah, so so, so one just, of the things that you'll see, that. it's that's kind of important. fun, is that both Paul's letters and the Catholic epistles are simply an order of length from the longest to the shortest. Um, with the exceptions being the seconds, they just tucked them right after the first because otherwise we'd be lost. So, right. um, so Paul's orders are just an order of length, with Romans being the longest and Philemon being the shortest. Um, it's just the way it goes. Catholic epistles are also an order of length, with Hebrews being the longest and Jude being the shortest. We we mentioned that because we started off by asking if there was a theological significance yeah. in the ordering. So, and in that sense, no, no. <laughs> it's just we got a scroll. We got this much scroll. We got to fit as much of it on as we can. So we're going to start with the longest, make sure yeah. we get those. We can, we can always squeeze in Jude if we have to. Right? Yeah, maybe we'll lose a short one at the <laughs> end if we run out of paper, but at least we only lost a short one. You can squeeze all of Philemon into one column if you have to. How so, many Philemons can you fit on the head yeah, of a pin, Kevin? Exactly. So so there, and that's, and that's kind of a good thing to remember in all of this is that there are reasons for a lot of what's going on in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that you apply that down to the nth degree. So the yeah. fact that you know Corinthians precedes Galatians doesn't necessarily mean anything other than it's longer. Especially since we've had an entire episode that talked about priority. Yeah. As as Westerners, we tend to think that the first thing takes priority over the second thing. Which it kind of does if you look as far as sections. That's why Gospels perhaps, first, yeah. Paul's per, second, Paul's third. But within but that, that's not, not so but much. It's not, yeah, it's not a universal, this is always the way it is, but because right. our Western mind is trained to think that yep. way, we might bring that, we might be tempted to bring that to Scripture and say, well, therefore. Yeah. And, know, and we will John at is some not point. important, Kevin. It's the fourth no. Gospel. Yeah, that's the best Matthew, to last. Clearly, Matt, no, Matthew yeah, I think is they say more the important. <laughs> so we will do, at some point, we will have a discussion on the formation of the canon 
and some of these issues. Um, not today. Not as I think you had mentioned, not as part of the hermeneutic right. series, because that doesn't necessarily fit. Um, Kevin, what can what can people look forward to as we continue this series? We talked briefly before we started about some of the things that where where this series is going to lead. Let's let's share a little bit about that. Well, now that we've we've kind of laid out some real basics about the overview of the Bible, the structure of it, the editorial issues, those kind of things. Now we're actually going to start getting into some issues with how to read. You know, these sections, how do you read the Gospels? How do you read Paul? How do you read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament? What do we do? And how do we actually open the text and start reading? How, what guides us? Um, how do we read parables? How do you read parables? We're going to get into, into some of those details at some point. Those can be crazy. <laughs> We're also going to um, spend just a, a brief amount of time talking about some hermeneutical statements of the past in the church, such as scripture interprets scripture. Mm, so yeah. we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time kind of talking about what those kinds of phrases mean as we seek to read this Bible according to God's will. Which, oddly enough, this whole priority thing is kind of, spoiler alert, yes. a way of saying scripture interprets scripture. Yes. And how to actually exactly. do that. <laughs> exactly. Spoil, sorry, spoilers. Spoiler, yes. Yeah. Okay. But... Anyways, the all of that you didn't give me a wrap up so I could say that's the crucial conversation. We should it's Jesus. Yeah. I mean all all of this is with the goal, like Kevin said, of getting you to read scripture, but also helping you see how it all points to Christ, because yep. that is the crucial conversation. That's that's what we got for you this week. You guys know how to ask us questions if you've been watching, listening. I guess you can't really watch. We're watching, listening, website, crucialproductions.org. Ask a question at the top. Send a question to our email address, questions at crucialproductions.org. If you have an idea for an episode or a question in this hermeneutic series, please send it to us. If you have questions about anything we've said and you're confused or worried that we're walking the plank into heresy, we want to hear <laughs> about that too. <laughs> That's important. That, that kind of feedback and that pushing back is important. We want to hear that from you. So uh, until next time. Well, see you guys. See ya.